Okay, hello and welcome everyone. This is the webinar for the Supply Chain on Blockchain Conference to give you a bit of an introduction to the area. So um, Val, um, please take it away. Thank you, Peter. Hi everybody, my name is Val, or for more formal setting, Dr. Valeri Natanelov. I am a postdoc research fellow at the University of uh, Queensland University of Technology, working on the Beef Ledger project. So today we'll be discussing in a very simple and uh, gentle manner the concept of supply chain and blockchain and how they come together. This meant as an introduction to both uh, elucidate certain concepts to you and hopefully entice you to either attend or uh, watch and read more on the supply chain and blockchain conference on the 15th of July. So we'll keep this uh, quite in uh, formal so the participants can ask questions during the presentation or after uh, and hopefully everybody will have a good time. So let's hit it off. Now before we start talking about the uh, very hype and sexy concepts of blockchain, uh, I would like to focus on the basic socioeconomic concepts and let's look at sort of the historical concept of trade right like it existed from the times of silk road and before where we had merchants sending away goods to distant places and there was always trade existing uh, and what was important in that situation is that we always want to minimize uncertainty and uh, increase the efficiency of trades where we can exchange value now Traditionally, this was done through uh, sending your family members with a caravan and even uh, armed forces to join them. However, over time, this went into a more formal setting. And these sort of uh, settings where we conduct trade in are coined by Douglas C. North as institutions. I know most of you have an idea that institutions are these sort of semi-governmental agencies, but the concept of institutions is quite simply the humanly devised rules and constraints and structures to facilitate this uh, more efficient trade. Now, the role of these institutions specifically is all about agency and contract enforcement. Again, I mentioned, you know, in the olden days, this was about sending a family member and, and armed forces with you. Uh, more uh, modern sense, this meant like it's settings like banks, letter of credits and other uh, administrative tools. Um, and another role of institutions is that uh, for efficient markets, what we want is a low monitoring and transaction costs. Um, this will become a bit more clear when we come back to the uh, concept of supply chains. But here, keep in mind that when two parties engage in trade, often problems arise when there is an asymmetry in the transaction costs. Okay. Now, let's focus on the concept of supply chain itself. I just described very, very briefly the concept of trade between, let's say, two parties. And a supply chain simply is a system or a network of resources, organizations, individuals, activities, technologies, information, and any type of goods, services, processes to, um, throughout a chain to add value and deliver a final good or product or service to an end consumer. Now, here what is important to note is that there is a flow of goods throughout the chain between different entities, and there is a flow of money. Throughout this flow, there is also other actors such as logistics companies and, and, and transport, but also banks for financing and insurances uh, for you know, protecting risk and minimizing that uncertainty. Now, this supply chain that is represented here very nicely, often in practice, it's more complicated where you have some entities taking care of several steps or only one. Uh, other times this can be fully integrated and that's what we call a vertical integration. Now, an interesting question might be, why don't we have a few hundred companies in the world who are fully integrated and take care of all our goods and needs and resources? Well, the simple answer to that is, not to go into too much detail, is that in a vertical integrated system, that system is very unresilient. So when things change, and all of us know that things change all the time, the system or that company cannot adapt. And that's why that large companies often have more potential for higher efficiency and also higher margins, but there is also higher risk when something goes wrong, their whole supply chain uh, will crumble and you know, they'll have to encounter a lot of losses. So in a way, supply chains are very organically formed throughout the 
let's say, uh, formation of economies and civilizations, and they're very necessary. And often these supply chains are not necessarily formalized. It's basically actors that are interacting with each other and they're doing their best to do this as efficient as possible. In other cases, this can be more formalized through a formalized network, uh, organizations, associations that try to help uh, networks and different actors to uh, make the process more efficient and interact and transact uh, smoothly and more efficiently. So what's important to keep in mind here, so in each of these transaction steps between different entities, the goal is always the same. We want to minimize uncertainty and we want to uh, make the trade and the exchange of value more efficient. And again, how do we do that? We always do that focusing on agency and contract enforcement. And on the other end, we want low monitoring and transaction costs. Now, um, in terms of the supply chain, they don't exist for the sake of themselves. There is always the end goal, which is the demand from the end consumer, right? For example, when a consumer or a viewer looks at this jacket, they see a jacket. A supply chain manager would not see a jacket. He would see a whole system of activities and uh, transactions that go from the growing of cotton crop and everything that goes with it uh, to processing it, selling it abroad, moving it, the logistics, taking care of the buttons and other, uh, let's say, components of this uh, holistic product, let's call that, that at the end is delivered and distributed to the end consumer, okay? So here I would like to sort of again highlight that the supply chain can be very complicated, but in its core, it's all about transaction, sort of a cascading transactions of goods and services between entities. And here we wanna focus again on minimizing the uncertainty and making sure that when the goods are sent, there is a flow of money in return within the agreed uh, set of terms. Now, when I mentioned the whole uh, Silk Road and the traditional uh, setting, let's say the old school setting, I, I always think of Marco Polo, uh, often what was also the problem and what's important to note here that whenever we wanna talk about monitoring and transaction costs and making sure that the contracts are enforced, what is important is standardization about agreements of what is quality, what metrics do we use and what quality of a specific product that needs to be predefined is agreed for a predefined price. Uh, and this is something that's often, you know, in practice requires either bartering between parties or create some kind of friction within the supply chain system. Okay, I hope this was somewhat clear. I'll come back to this after we look at the concept of blockchain. Now, I'm sure all of you heard about blockchain and I'll try to on purposely avoid words uh, that are already sort of predetermined and linked to it. Uh, and I always like to explain blockchain as a multi-node registry. So uh, and a registry is basically taking notes, right? So we have um, different nodes wherever an asset and the transactions are noted on. And whenever a new transaction incurs, these are noted on the whole system so everybody has the same copy and through encryption this becomes immutable and trustworthy so in a nutshell a blockchain is a multi-node registry or a ledger that contains assets and why i quoted the term asset it's because you know we're talking here about digital assets uh, and the transaction so the easiest uh, example of this is bitcoin the assets itself is a digital concept that people give value to and people transact that between each other. And each time there is a transaction, each node has a note of that. So because of this, it makes it uh, quite efficient and immutable, makes it very trustworthy. Uh, now, an additional layer uh, that is of interest is the concept of smart contracts. Now, when we have a transaction of different assets that are immutable, we can also build certain conditions built, um, built on top of these uh, transactions that can be either executed or not if these conditions are met. Again, I'll come back to this in a bit, uh, but before moving on, we'll come back to this concept of a digital asset. So what good is a blockchain to you or me? 
yes, it's fantastic for having transacting digital currencies, but most people are not very convinced by that. And the real, let's say, magical value of blockchain is, consists where we can link that digital technology to real wor world assets. And the most easy example is often with real estate. So for example, in Europe, the notaries, I guess in Australia and other worlds, this will be the solicitors, uh, embark on the blockchain journey because they see that in their case, because their job is mostly record assets, which is, let's say, houses and, and uh, different type of uh, you know, buildings, and note how they are transacted, who is a different owner. So that's basically like the, the simplest definition of a real world application on the blockchain, where a house has an owner, so the house is an asset, and sometimes the owner change and there is a transaction. Currently, we do that through, uh, again, notaries or solicitors, and through the blockchain, this could be a much more efficient system and a smooth system to come to the same uh, end result. Now, why do I mention housing? Because that's an easy example, because with a house, you can write the house address and digitize that and make that into a digital asset. Okay, so when we have a house, you cannot really move the house and change the house. So it's also the, uh, impossible to cheat from the physical sphere and relatively easy to translate that concept of a, a real world asset into a digital asset and continue into its transactions. Things become a little bit more tricky when we start talking about uh, different assets. For example, there is interest in uh, blockchain and diamonds where, you know, diamonds are high value assets that can be transacted between different parties. Now, in case of diamonds, you'll have to come to packaging and different uh, ways to make sure that to protect that the link between your physical asset and the digital asset or the, the, the translation identification of that asset is not only uh, accurate, but also secure and immutable in itself because the blockchain ensures immutability within the digital realm. However, it requires you know, an additional design step or thinking step when considering the physical assets, okay? I know I, I devote a little bit extra time on that, but it is very important when we talk about supply chains. And when we talk about the supply chain and the blockchain, as I just mentioned, we can see almost intuitively that is an organic evolution of going using the blockchain technology to make the supply chain markets more efficient. I mentioned for a good supply chain and a general trading situation, we want low monitoring costs and agency and contract enforcement. So what does blockchain offer us? It offers us an immutable ledger of assets and transactions, which is beautiful. That's what we want. We want uh, low monitoring and transaction costs. And it also offers us concept of agency and contracts informants through smart contracts. Okay, now that's very nice. And it means that there is sort of a push from the supply side to adopt this technology or at least explore it further. However, there is also maybe even more important, the sync or the demand pull side from the evolving consumer. Now the consumer is in the end, the one that holds the power of spending their hard earned money, right? And the consumer today is always uh, changing and evolving, especially in the time of social media, where they're not only wanting to their concerns about product safety be verified, but they also want to know if a certain quality and ideology is met when producing, transacting, developing, or any type of process within the supply chain of their end product or service that they consume. And here again, in terms of product safety, quality and ideology, we come back that blockchain can offer another efficiency tool to provide that uh, service or let's say that additional value to the consumer where we can have more product information that is both uh, focused on safety and quality, but also on the ideology of the consumer and can facilitate their decision in the buying process, right? And of course, the consumer is not only wants the, the, the ideas of, of digital uh, information, they want it to be both trustworthy and immutable. I'm not sure how many people still trust the word uh, green or the label organic. They also want it to be presented into them in a 
more accessible way. Now, it is also here that blockchain offers very interesting opportunities where the end consumer can inherently by design trust the system that the information presented there about food safety is accurate, but also encounters information that tells them where is a certain product made. You know, I mentioned this jacket and when I spend my money, let's say I would like it to uh, make sure that the process of making this jacket doesn't include environmentally damaging processes or uh, certain uh, labor standards that are met or in a country that I like or prefer or see it as a high quality standard. And for this reason as well, blockchain can in the same concept of an immutable ledger that presents assets, transaction information uh, to the end user present an optimal uh, situation to utilize that in the supply chain. Now, to summarize, we mentioned the basic concept of trade, how supply chain in a simple way is a chain of different uh, transactions between different entities. We want to minimize uncertainty and maximize the efficiency and that blockchain could be a, a very interesting uh, tool and a technology to do so. I also mentioned that there are some bottlenecks or some things that need to be overcome before this uh, technology really becomes uh, feasible in the real world market where we have that concept of physical assets and digital assets. And on the other end, we also have business as usual because in a perfect world, this presentation make it seem that, oh, well, let's adopt blockchain as it is. However, there is a transitional stage where the current supply chains are operating quite okay. Like everything is relative. So when we talk about efficiency, we mean that things can be better, but things still working. I can still buy a jacket and a shirt and a sandwich. Um, and this transaction still happen today in different manners. So for example, uh, some things are still on pen and paper. Other things are relatively digitized. If we look at concepts like the digital platforms on Alibaba or different uh, other ways to exchange uh, goods. However, in terms of the transitioning from a current state of a supply chain to a, let's say a more efficient uh, and effective uh, way of using supply chain these two concepts need to be overcome and why do i highlight this specifically because now we're going to look into a specific uh, example the the beef ledger project where we see that you know in the initial stages where we had contact with different market participants and you also see that unlike the conceptual presentation, the real world situation is already much more complicated. And still this is a very symbolic representation and the real supply chain can get even more complicated where we have different actors potentially interacting with different with each other or in a different way uh, and also creating different possibilities of exchanging that value. Now here, the main question is always about how do you link uh, physical assets to digital assets. And in a way, other technology paves the way for that. So we have the concept of IoT or Internet of Things. Basically, these are technological devices that are added, linked, um, or engaged with, with the physical process that either can store uh, data about the process. So for example, in our case, we will be looking at uh, the, the geolocation of, of cattle, but also on their um, general well-being standards from oxygenation level and temperature level to ensure uh, that we know not only which animal is uh, linked to what ID, digital ID, but also to give proper information about the, the let's say, the aggregate um, value that we want to offer to the end consumer, where that traceability not can start from the beginning but also the the following and aggregating of information has to happen there now that's a fantastic thing however in order to apply that to a whole um, supply chain it requires the collaboration and use of all the supply chain participants so in order to say that the steak that will be exported and finally uh, eaten by somebody in Asia or Shanghai, let's say, that we know from which breeding property it comes, 
the, the process that the uh, animal went through, uh, about, uh, reporting about its animal welfare, uh, where it was slaughtered, and how, et cetera, and that the, the, the product during shipping uh, and, and other transport maintained high quality standards of temperature to ensure that this nice piece of steak that the end consumer is eating uh, is also communicated to the consumer and they can be fully engaged uh, with the product and have full trust in that. Now, uh, that also implies that we will have a huge amount of data and it's not always very sexy data, let's say, you know, where the, the weight of the cattle, the temperature of the cattle, and how the cattle is moved and processed, uh, but also the data of the transactionability at current state, where we have a buyer report or certain health declarations. These all need to be sort of absorbed into a next layer and harmonized and standardized, you could say in a way, and be fed into the, let's say, the blockchain layer. In that blockchain layer, we can have the ability to transact, let's say, the, the, the transaction, so it will be immutable, but also create smart contracts uh, based on certain variables. So let's say I and Peter have a deal where I promise him to deliver a certain amount of cattle of a certain breed, of a certain quality, and we agree on a specific price. The cattle is delivered, and Peter claims that, well, Val, that cattle you promised, it's all great, but it's marbling score, uh, the fat, uh, fattening uh, level of, of the beef is not as high as you promised, so I'm not interested to pay as we agreed. And to make sure that these kind of discussions don't uh, cause tension or friction in the chain, through that uh, data processing and, and digitization, basically the immutable component of it, I can say, ah, oh, you know what, Peter, let's have a look at the data. You might be right, but you're exaggerating a bit. I'm okay to take a cut of 2%. And through that process, um, make that transaction more uh, smooth. Now, I also mentioned this example for another reason, because when we talk about blockchain, supply chain, and smart contracts, often people think like, wonderful, we don't need people. Let's just have robots. They will transact everything. And you know, this, this process will be fully automated. Well, yes and no. In a way, we, will, we are far from, if we ever reach there, from that full automation. And we must never forget that the concept of trade can never ignore the human um, aspect. Okay, so yes, we can create smart contracts that pre-program certain uh, execution in function of trade. But in case of Beef Ledger, for example, well, we always want to make sure that we focus on the information transparency and keep in mind that the information asymmetry was the main problem of high transaction costs and created issues in in uh, trade uh, and and between you know parties and in the supply chain so that the entities themselves can decide to proceed and within a certain range of negotiation okay and it is here that the concept and the, and the practice are brought together. And while interesting, it is quite a lot of work, but the potential is quite high because both from the, the supplier side, let's say the supply chain itself, a lot of efficiency can be gained. And at the same time, the evolving consumer creates a lot of incentive and in time will demand more accurate information about the product. Whew. Now, that was a bit of a whirlwind. I hope it's, um, you know, reached the audience to some extent. And please uh, feel free now to give me all kinds of complicated and difficult questions or simple ones. And thank you for listening. Peter, I think now we can move to uh, the question section. Yes, for sure. And I, I, I'm, I'm, think, I'm thinking up my own question at, right as we speak. Um, and I, I know my, my initial question is actually, as a warm-up for everyone else, is not actually directly related, but related to your example. So, do, so people who are growing cattle for sale, they, uh, the cow doesn't live on the same property from when it's born to when it you know, goes off for slaughter. It, there are completely separate 
different um, places for the um, feed lot and uh, fattening property. So that, is, that, is that how okay. it works? So it could work in different ways. So some uh, breeders can also grow their own cattle and sell it on the sale yard or to the abattoir. Other breeders or the same breeder can sell some of its uh, cattle uh, that's relatively young to a feedlot. And often a feedlot is a grain fed, but sometimes it can also be grass fed. But let's say that the feedlot is where a cattle is grain fed to reach maturity. Uh, and then can be, again, either sold to a sale yard or directly to an abattoir, or that, let's call them the, the, the feedlot producer, can choose to say, I'm going to pay the abattoir to process my cattle, and I'm going to export myself. And same goes for the fattening property mm -hmm. of, of a grass-fed one, where somebody says, no, grass-fed cattle is more tasty. That is my brand. Uh, that's what I like. That's what I believe in. That's what my family did they can engage in a similar process. And why I complicate this a bit, because a supply chain is never as simple as little dots connecting to each other. Each entity can choose to engage in one specialized service or can say, well, I see more potential and I think I have the capability to transact several steps of the supply chain. And in doing so, increasing my margins or profit, but also um, providing more uh, value or, or having to do extra work. I don't know if that answers your question somewhat, but uh, I, I think that the, the important thing is that the breeding property can be specialized, but can also choose to conduct other parts of the, or other steps of the supply chain. And that's why in practice, often these supply chains are entangled uh, and most people do several things where a part of cattle, for example, from a, a feedlot is sold directly to a sale yard and a maybe a smaller part is sold, uh, sort of is exported by themselves where they buy services from abattoir and logistics companies to try to export them. And, and the question here is always about like diversification and making sure that uh, there is enough ability to handle different steps of the supply chain. <clears throat> because keep in mind what I mentioned, you could say, well, and they exist. There are huge companies that go through the whole process by themselves. Okay. And you can start specializing in one step or several steps, but the bigger you get, the more uh, difficult it is to remain resilient throughout the process. And what do I mean by that? For example, let's say uh, if you're a big company and there is a drought or a disease, the, the whole uh, collapse or, or the blow will have to be taken on the much larger scale while the supply chains can adapt more quickly and still interact in, in, in value creation and value addition. Mm -hmm. uh, CMAC, do you have a question? Yes, actually, uh, I have two questions. Basically, my question is related to the mechanism that blockchain works. You know, let's say I'm in a restaurant and I want to order a steak. Does it mean that uh, I need many other people to confirm the quality of the steak based on their actually version of the information that, that they have there uh, on their uh, machines? And the second question is, these uh, blockchain or supply chain based on blockchain. Does it mean that uh, the we don't need anymore, we don't need organizations that monitor the quality of, let's say, a product, let's say they provide a label on, on the product that indicates the quality of the product? Are, um, I mean, is this supply chain on blockchain replaces those organizations? Okay, very interesting question. So let's let's do them one by one. We you talked about a customer when they want to uh, confirm a certain quality of a steak in the restaurant, correct? Yeah. And you said like traditionally, what you would have is that a customer is in the restaurant and there is a Yelp review, and then people give uh, sort of socialized comments about the restaurant itself and about some dishes. That's the situation right now. And you asking in a way what's different or similar if we would use that system where the customer can verify the quality through the blockchain. Well, the, 
the difference is quite um, pronounced or, or, you know, quite elegant as well, because right now uh, I know things about the restaurant I, from a social perspective. Uh, I know that maybe there has been, and this is in a way related to your second question, uh, a certification from a health inspector on the restaurant with the letter B or A or whatever. And I also know that people like it, but I never know that the piece of beef or whatever is on my meal, what is exactly up with that? What is that piece's quality specifically? And what was its journey, etc.? So the advantage of uh, using a blockchain-based system is that the um, customer can still rely on the, the general, let's say, uh, evaluation of his peers and the health rating of the uh, uh, inspector and other ratings, but the specification of what you're consuming right now is not there. And it's only a matter of time that the customer will say that, I want to know what this piece of meat, uh, what is its quality, why does it cost so much, and what am I paying for? And that's the advantage of having the, <clears throat> let's say, the blockchain system or one of. And of course, why I presented that, that uh, layered system of, of beef ledger, because the one doesn't have to exclude the other. In a way, you create more information because a restaurant can still function as it is. And let's assume that restaurant is part of the uh, beef uh, ledger system. That restaurant can say, oh, and if you, you know, scan a QR code here or there uh, or next to your plate, if they want to be that advanced, you can have even more information and more sort of clarification, transparency about what you're consuming right now. The story about that. So that, that should cover the first uh, question. And in a way, your second question is somewhat related where you ask, well, what about the, the you know, these organizations that uh, currently exist and, and need to ensure uh, the health rating or the quality? They don't necessarily need to go, but their life and their work can be made much easier because um, the whole process that we are describing right now involves different actors, but it also involves policymakers, customs, it involves uh, verification of points of origin and health and quality as well. So all these uh, actors, they're quite important in our supply chains and the products we, we consume. They, they try to do their best to make sure that not only they're safe, but they're actually represented in quality, but that the blockchain can make things much easier because if that actor is still there and they should be there. We were not propagating to, to say, oh, these actors are not important anymore, but they can really have a much smoother and efficient way of providing that quality assessment. Because normally you have random sampling uh, and you give someone a quality assessment, but here you can always have a, a continuous stream to make sure that certain a uh, flow of products retains a certain level of quality. And the, and, the, and the goal here is not one of revolution where we say, oh, let's throw away all these things. No, no, it is more one of evolution where we say, we can focus on things that are really important. We can focus on how do we calculate now a high quality rating based on all this interesting information where we can do this on a continuous basis, right? Because this information keeps flowing. And not only that, we can also say, hey, we have this very interesting flow of assets, but something went wrong with that one specific cow or product, and you can take it out without the risk of damaging your whole re reputation. Does that make sense, Yamak? So in, in yeah, a yeah. nutshell, it's all about evolving the current system and assisting all the entities into focusing on what they're good at. And if some are good at defining quality, well, they should be engaged in developing advanced or dynamic algorithms that I can assess it on a continuous basis instead of throwing them out, okay? And, and this, is, this goes same for collaboration with uh, government officials to say that, look, we have certain things, but you need that in a certain format of standard, right? And that's why, for example, that standardization and, and adaptability and, and let's say sort of agnosticism of, of technology is also very important. We can say no problem, you need it in this way that there is an additional layer that can transform the information in the mode you need. So we can take it two stances. Either we can say we 
will uh, make it much easier to comply with external agencies by creating a new layer, or we can help the existing agencies and entities have, have a much easier and smoother life by collaborating and sort of helping them uh, focus on what they're really good at or what's their really, you know, the, the, the core importance. Yep. Thank you so much. Sure. We've got a question in the chat, um, so which I think relates to you know how we talk about that blockchains are mutable, and so you were talking about a um, the marbling factor and how you might have a dispute over the marbling factor. So at some point, I guess in the supply chain, once the meat's being packaged, or you know when would the the quality assessment go into the blockchain, you know, this immutable blockchain, and then who gets to assess, you know, is, is it that you've got two assessments that differ in their quality decisions or, and, and so when, what happens? So that, that's a, a tricky and an interesting question, but it's, it's not necessarily the quality assessment is not a one-time thing, right? Keep in mind when we talk about uh, perishable goods, a fancy term for food or, or any organic uh, components, it's, it can go wrong at any moment in time. So what is important throughout the system is that this monitoring is consistent. So pre-processing, so when the cattle is still cattle and not made into steak, uh, it is important to make sure that the animal is well. And that's why these sensors are measuring and transmitting continuously their well-being. And keep in mind at the same time, helping the, the producer or farmer optimize their efficiency in production. If the animal is sick, they can take them out quickly or remedy that. So that monitoring is continuous. And after it's a steak, when that's important, that's maybe slightly easier where you say, well, it needs to be chilled uh, or, or frozen. And then we have, you know, old type of science where we know it's good, the shelf life is this long. And then the monitoring is all about always monitoring that that temperature never fluctuates. So one of the biggest challenges that we also trying to, to, to address through the, the beef ledger, we set out an opportunity that, well, this transaction ability through blockchain is great, but this continuous monitoring and transmitting the results to the blockchain through the smart contract sort of to say that yes, uh, throughout that layer of transport, the, the, um, you know, the, the product was within the chilled uh, range. So that condition is met. And, you know, through the, the smart contract of blockchain, this can not only continue because people can choose to continue, but give continuous accurate information. And that's, that's where the difference of thinking comes in because right now we have no other choice than do sampling. We, we sample stuff, we take a snapshot, while through the integration of technology of IoT, uh, big data and the blockchain, we make it more continuous and not only more reliable because of the immutability of blockchain, but more reliable because of continuous measuring. Because what happens if I send you beef and let's say you're in Malaysia and everything is nice and during the transport, the beef suddenly something went wrong on the ship the cooling mechanism wore off and it became unfrozen. Three hours later, everything is fine. The beef is frozen again, it comes to you and you think, well, everything is great, my beef is frozen. But in that period of three hours where the beef became unfrozen and there is degradation, you either, either that meat is uneatable or you should be compensated for reduced quality. Right now, you just don't know. And it's part of the inefficiency. So that's where the, the, the new way of thinking comes in that not only we want to improve things in terms of efficiency or value, you also want to remove these potential frictions because if you, as a entity that engages with me, you don't know, and even probably I don't know about that, but you have a less, you know, less superior product that you provide to uh, customers, you might think that I am not providing with a uh, good as promised product where our relationship might suffer and the long-term goals and, and processes and, and you know, inefficiencies of the supply chain might increase. So the, the idea is not only to facilitate and help people remove uncertainty from each other, but also about the general uncertainty, right? Where these type of things, even if they happen, 
that there is a clear cut. And in my case, I would say, wow, maybe I wish in that case it wasn't recorded because I would have had more money. But from a long-term perspective, I would say, no, no, it's fair that Peter will get the cut in price because he'll remain happy and I'm interested in doing business long-term because I want to make a lot of money instead of a one-time deal. Okay. Yeah, that, that's good. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It, it wasn't quite the answer to the question, but it gave a lot of perspective, which is also... I'm sorry. If you want, you can clarify. Maybe I misunderstood the question. No, no, no. It was essentially... Um, it was about who put the actual quality assessment in, but I think you probably did answer that right at the start of the... There is, um, that's like, the thing. There is, there, there is not one thing or one person who does it in. It's a continuous measurement that is both aggregated and gives you a, a video image instead of a snapshot. So I that know. when you have the end product, you have the full story instead of one assessment. Okay, well, that, that makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. All right, well, Val, um, we've come towards the end of our time. So thank you everyone for joining the call and people who see this call later on, if you've got questions, please fire them through. Um, and I'm sure um, Val will be happy to answer them. And um, so I'll stop recording now. So thank you. And. Um...